Okay, welcome everyone. Um, we, nice to see some of the faces that I see up on top, thumbnails, but uh, we've got uh, three nice programs tonight, uh, real nice, and one a little different. Uh, you know, we each we try to have each month a my favorite photos category, um, and this time it's a little bit different. So we have Mike Airy who's doing my favorite videos. Uh, so it's a nice little switch, and I'm sure that'll be great. So, um, uh, Mike, I'm going to ask if you could be, you're the cleanup batter, so you could be the third one. We'll start off, so we have Jake is going to talk about the Galapagos, but with a little different twist to it. Uh, it'll be the Galapagos in black and white. Uh, and we've all seen uh, Jake's photos, so we know what, uh, what to expect. And then Daryl is going to do a, a presentation on the depth of field, which is you know, something that people have been asking about, um, even though we've covered depth of field, but probably, I don't know how many years ago, and we have a lot of new people, and it's an important issue with photography, certainly to get in terms of getting um, enough area or as much area as we can in focus. So, uh, Jake, if uh, you want to begin, and then we could turn out turn it over to you. Black and white. I'm gonna say, Jake, this is the first time I've seen a, a presentation of the Galapagos in black and white. Really? Yeah. Well. <laughs> I'm, looking I'm, forward to I'm looking forward to your image. I'd like to start by saying there's been a lot of photographers through the years who've done really amazing work in the Galapagos, whether it's in color, doing film, video, and cinematography, whatever, photography, and quite a few series in black and white as well. In his book, Water Like Time, Dave Duble has some series from the Galapagos. Bernie Brooks has many photos, and Chuck Davis as well has some. And so I was in the Galapagos last summer on a kid's sea camp trip. I was acting as a photographer on the trip, but it was a very last minute trip for me. Thankfully, I have one of the sea rovers contacted me that there was an opening, and so I booked it. And I'd like to start off first by saying that not everything works in black and white. This was probably one of my favorite shots from the trip. I don't think this one works in black and white. It's hard to see a differentiation between the back foot and the rock and backscatter becomes a little bit more prevalent, although I don't really care that there's a lot of backscatter. It's part of the environment in this image. Here it is in color. I think it works a lot better in color. So not everything works perfectly in black and white, but the Galapagos has a lot of scenes that work really, really well in black and white. Very open ocean scenes, lots and lots and lots of fish. So one thing that I always try to take into account when photographing in black and white is called the zone system, developed many years ago by Ansel Adams. And it goes from zero to 10 on a scale of pure black to pure white. And Without getting very complicated on the zone system, you're welcome to look it up on your own. You generally want to have a photo that has a pretty big scale along the zone system. So a lot of nice blacks and a lot of highlights that are towards the white end. Photos with very little contrast exist around the middle, around four, five, and six. If you take a regular picture of the ocean, underwater and you convert it to black and white generally and again this is depending on your exposure but generally you'll wind up somewhere around here for the color of the water on the grayscale and so then it becomes up to you whether you want to burn it down a little bit make it a little bit darker lighten it up to make it a little bit whiter i'll get into high key and low key photography a little bit in this but again that's personal opinion of what you like Personally, I tend to shoot with a little bit darker blacks. I like to underexpose a little bit more, a little bit more mystery kind of in the work. 
but that's entirely up to you as a photographer. So on the trip, I shot pretty much every shoot with a 16 to 35 millimeter lens. I rented one for this trip because I wanted to get a little bit more telephoto. I had only ever photographed with fisheye lenses before this trip underwater. And so I, because the Galapagos has a lot of fish that are not totally right next to you or the hammerhead sharks or whale sharks swimming by, I wanted to have something that could get a little bit further. And this lens was absolutely perfect for this trip. So just a few key things to realize about black and white photography. And again, these aren't rules that you have to go by, but they help a lot. Subject isolation is really, really important. Putting a light subject on a dark black background or vice versa. That way you draw someone's eye specifically to that point within the image. And again, you're gonna use compositional rules rule of thirds, leading lines to accentuate that more. But when you're shooting in black and white, you really have to think in black and white. One of the things that I originally found when shooting in black and white, especially in the Galapagos, was I wanted to introduce structure into the photos. And I'll have a few examples of that, why that was important for me. Then of course, make use of high contrast scenes, lots of light, lots of dark shadows, but even in those high contrast scenes, you have to maintain detail in the highlights and shadows. So check that histogram on your camera, make sure you're not underexposing so much you can't get that data back or overexposing. Now my settings, generally F11 to F16 for aperture. I tend to shoot a little bit higher around there just so I get a little bit extra depth of field. Now you'll notice that the shutter speed setting is one one fifteenth of a second to one one five hundredth, very variable. That depended entirely on the scene I was shooting. I generally shot a little bit faster around one two fiftieth to one five hundredth for scenes with sharks or a lot of fish moving around. The one case that I used a one fifteenth of a second was looking straight down, very dark. So you gotta brighten it a little bit, even though it might look right to our eyes, to the camera, it's still pretty dark. And then the ISO, again, pretty variable, 200 to 800, but I like to stay on a lower end so you don't get too much noise, which when you convert to a black and white becomes a lot of grain. So now into some of the photos. Now I didn't plan to really shoot a lot of black and white series. And I'd like to also say that I didn't shoot anything in black and white, I would shoot it in color and convert it into black and white in Lightroom. But I didn't plan to do many black and whites. And I started doing them and thinking about shooting black and whites because on this very first dive, I set up the camera, everything was working perfectly. 20 minutes into the dive, my strobe stopped firing. So I thought, oh, great, final big trip. And of course my strobes aren't working. So I, I'm back on the boat, I'm looking at it, running a bunch of tests. And I couldn't figure it out. So I ran a few more tests after a couple dives. And I finally came to the conclusion that inside of the bulkhead of the camera, there was a little bit of corrosion. I had done 300 dives and never had a single problem with the strobes firing. On a big trip, they stopped firing. Hmm. So my mind instantly converted itself to shooting in black and white and shooting larger scenes without strobes. This particular shot is with the strobes of coral reef. I believe parrotfish marks are on this coral where they're biting it. This is also with a strobe. This was the last photo on the first day that I took with a strobe. Then it stopped working right after this shot. But we, a lot of the black and whites that I'm shooting, especially in these larger seascape series with fish, you don't necessarily need strobes. They're not really gonna do much for the scene. And so I kind of shifted both my understanding of shooting black and whites towards that, but also trying to change how I saw the images without strobes. And shooting in that black and white mindset really helps with that. I'd never really shot a ton of black and whites underwater before, 
they've mainly only been on land and with film and like in the dark room. I spent many hours in the dark room burning and dodging and working on shots there, all in black and white. And so it translates over exactly the same to visualizing in black and white, not visualizing in color. So like I said a little bit before, including structure, this is on the northernmost island, Darwin, which is a big boat ride from the actual Galapagos archipelago, but it's filled with millions and millions of fish. And I've always tried to get some sort of structure or form either from the fish or from the topography itself in the scene to give it a sense of place and also a sense of scale. Here's another example. This is on the same wall, Darwin's Reef. Whereas you have a scene like this, where you're just looking at fish. And I think it's kind of cool, but personally, I don't really care for this image because it doesn't work to meet what I would think is a very comprehensive composition where a viewer is able to look at it and follow a single idea throughout it. When I look at this, your eye doesn't really know where to look. It kind of goes down here, looks in the dark a little bit, pops up here into the lights as well and doesn't have a real rhythm. In this image, it has a little bit more of a rhythm. So your eye goes to the lights, then follows the silhouettes of these fish in the foreground and looks around. But still, I, this isn't what I wanted. Then I have this image. I really love this image. I wish I was zoomed out a little bit more. This is at 27 millimeters. I was photographing them a little bit closer. And then these millions of fish instantly all darted down in one direction, which is what I had been hoping for, to get them going in one direction. And they did this because a giant tuna swam right by them. I didn't get any shots of the tuna, it was like a torpedo, but I got the fish and I was pretty happy with this. So within this giant wall of fish, you have them broken up in the back, then the wall here, but of more of a primary subject for one of them, that your eye would look at would be this one down here in the third. And then even more so of that, having subject isolation, silhouetted jacks on the back background, but you see there's still a little bit of enough detail in this top one. You can see the outline of the eye, as well as detail in this one. And then the rule of odds, you have three of them, all swimming in one direction. I didn't get many good dolphin shots on the trip, although we saw them on almost every single dive. They, you would hear them about five minutes before you would see them, they would fly by you. On a few dives, they hung around a little bit, but a little bit too far away for me to shoot for a lot of the stuff. This guy, um, James Comey, was one of the directors of the trip. Very nice guy. And here he is shooting these three. This was on Wolf Island, a little bit south of Darwin. And this was the image that I mentioned, that's 1 15th of a second. I was sitting at about 70 feet, looking down to, this is around 110, 120 feet. So with that much water in between the camera and these scalloped hammerheads and stuff looking down, it's a lot of haze. And so on a scene like that, it's very hard to shoot and do it well in color. So this is one of the cases where shooting with the black and white mindset really helps. A really bad color image can be saved by turning it into black and white a lot of times. In color, this is very washed out, very flat, barely any contrast, but in black and white, it works a little bit better. Mm -hmm. A permit swimming by, again, making use of silhouettes. And then of course, whale sharks. This one was the first one that we saw that was really big, probably about 35 to 40 feet is what the dive guide said. And he swam in at about 60 feet. Everyone swam up to see him. Then he started diving down, straight down into the depth and went probably down to about 150, 160. I chased him down to about 120 to get this photograph. And I was mentioning the zone system a little bit earlier. The water is pretty gray, 
but then you have a highlight here on the head of the whale shark that really brings your eye to the lightest part of the frame. The eye will always go to the lightest part of the frame. And then it kind of walks you around with all these little fish. Compositionally, I'm happy with this as what it is because I couldn't keep up with this whale shark to get anywhere near close to its head and to get a kind of portrait of it. So for a full body shot, I was happy enough with this. This one though, I like a little bit more. So over the reef, Jack's falling along, millions of fish around it. And then, like I said, introducing structure for scale. This one was probably about the size of a school bus, also very large, just a massive, massive fish. It was really incredible to see them. And on quite a few of the dives, I would just put the camera down and just watch them to be in complete awe of them. We ended up seeing, I think it was seven in total on the week that we were there. And then of course the hammerheads are another huge attraction. I was there in late June into July and normally there's a lot of hammerheads there. I don't know the exact peak season for hammerheads, but it wasn't some of the images that I've seen with walls of them. There were certainly many of them and we saw probably hundreds throughout the week, but they weren't schooling quite as much as photos I had seen. It was usually individuals or small groups of three or four of them. But I was always looking up, everyone else was looking out into the reef. I like to look up and photograph all the fish above me and a hammerhead happened to swim by right into this group of fish. I love this composition where it's flying right into them, looking into the frame in the lower third. And this is beneath some pompanos at the surface. And some jacks swimming along. On most of the dives in Darwin and Wolf, you're going to surface out in the blue. So you might spend the first half of the dive a little bit more sometimes on the reef, just sitting there waiting for stuff to come by. And then you swim out into the blue and surface out there. You can't surface close to the rocks because you'll get crashed against the shoreline. This is on Isla Fernandina, one of the southern islands in the archipelago. Black corals on this beautiful reef. This is what would be considered a low key image. Very, very dark blacks. I tend to shoot darker. I like really rich tones and darker blacks. I don't like really, really bright whites. Although in some cases they work, I just don't really prefer them in my imagery. So I, I love the contrast here. Bright light on the corals. This was the last day of diving that we did and my strobes finally started working again. I got them up and working for this dive in particular. And some of my favorite images from the trip, the school of jacks, absolutely massive school of them. Right at the surface. I asked the dive guide, he said they were probably about from 10 feet down to right around 70 here. So I'm sitting pretty far back from them. So there's a lot of water in between me and them that makes it very hazy. And so when you're processing images like this, I don't really do a lot of editing. I just convert them to black and white, mess around with contrast and highlights and shadows. But with this one, you add a little bit of dehaze, maybe 10%, just to bump up the clarity in any so you can see all the fish because we're working in a very difficult environment. There's lots of haze underwater. And so you have to counteract that both with your photography and with your post-processing. This was in the shallows of Isla Fernandina, all these little tiny fish. I shot with strobes to highlight them, bounce all the light off of them back at the camera to get this beautiful, kind of shimmering, shimmering flow of them at the surface. While I was photographing these, everyone else on the dive was photographing a oceanic manta that very surprisingly flew by. And of course, I didn't see that I was photographing these little fish, but I don't regret it. <laughs> I really like this image. I, I think it's, it's a very simple image, but I'm really happy with the composition 
Galapagos shark right in the middle of the frame, but it works in this case. Not everything works in the middle of the frame, but it only works in this case because you have more primary fish that are, of course, very much smaller than the shark is in real life, but in the photo using scale, they're larger than it, the same size. And again, very dark sh shadows, highlights, nice and white. I really like using silhouettes in black and whites to add that extra bit of contrast. If you can shoot a silhouette, do it. I always love silhouettes. They work really, really well, especially in black and whites. They do work in color as well, a nice blue background, sun rays coming through. But personally, I just love them in black and whites. And like I said, adding structure, this is just a little coral mount on Darwin Island and we would sit in front of this on every single dive. And on every single dive I photographed it. There was a couple dives where there would be a diver sitting here. And I'm, I have a few shots of that. I don't really like the diver in the photo though as much as the pure environment in itself. You can see way up in the corner here, there's a little bit of someone's bubbles. It was very hard, especially in the Galapagos where you're with 20 other divers to not get bubbles in your shot. And when you're shooting in black and white, textures become very, very prominent. And so bubbles become a main center of attention within a photo. So you really have to be aware of where people are breathing their bubbles going up and get them out of the frame. Unfortunately, in this case, got a little bit, but I don't think it's too bad. This was on Wolf Island. I really just love this scene, the waves crashing up against the surface, big leading line of the coral reef, very dark shadows. Like I said, I like really rich blacks. They work really well when printing as well. A little bit further down the same reef, just the amazing amount of biomass that the Galapagos has was unbelievable. It was definitely some of my favorite diving that I've ever done. Really incredible environment. And I wanted to end with this, which is by far my favorite black and white picture I made on the series. This group of, I believe they're wrasse or Creole wrasse, they're just clustering together in this beautiful kind of almost like in Nemo when you see all the turtles on the East Australian current, that's what I think of it as, this kind of current of the fish following in a kind of a slide. But then to break up that composition, you have a specific fish to look at here on the side and then a surgeon fish way off in the background. And those two fish are really important in this composition to pull your eye to those two points. The leading line of both the structure of the coral reef and the fluid movement of the fish bring your eye to here, but these two little fish bounce it back and forth between those elements to create more of a comprehensive composition. And so for that reason, and also that this was probably one of my favorite dives in just seeing a moment like this. This is definitely my favorite image of the series. So yeah, with that, any questions? Well, stunning, really superb work, Jake, really. Thank wow. you. I have a question. Yep. Um, I, I really love it, yep. especially the last shot, I really liked it. Um, you probably mentioned it, but I don't even know if it's possible. Like when you switch to black and white, did you change the the screen setting to black and white or you're trained, you're already trained to read the histogram and know what to expect? You know, I say to look at the histogram, I really don't use histograms too much. I'll, I'll use them usually when I'm looking back on a boat reviewing after a first dive. When I'm underwater, I just kind of look for contrast and build off of that contrast. Like where you have a silhouette of a fish against a sunny sky, that's what I look for mainly. 
in terms of post-processing, I'm just bringing them into Lightroom and clicking e to turn it to black and white and then just messing around there. I don't do too much processing on them, just adding a little bit of contrast. Generally upping exposure, maybe by five points. I think that helps a lot with black and whites and the uh, linear gradient mask works very well, especially because usually when you're looking at a scene straight on, you have a very big gradient, that grayscale from black to white at the surface. And so you have to offset that within the frame. Does that sort of answer your question? Uh, sort of, but the, you don't change the setting on the camera to like when you review during the dive, it's still colored. So you yeah. need to like keep in mind that it's like it's gonna yeah. be black and white and yeah, okay. I just look for, I look for contrast yeah, look for and light contrast. are the two things that I look for. I've kind of trained my mind to see in black and white. I know that sounds strange, but that's sort of what I've done in trying to photograph in that way. Yeah, I mean if you take a lot of photos in black and white, I, I guess your brain will get used to it eventually. For me, when I do black and white, it's like during post-processing, if the color doesn't work, let's see how it's gonna be black and white. <laughs> Sometimes <Yeah>. it works. <laughs> you know, in movies, like, if you can't make it good, make it 3D. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of like that for me. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, Jake, uh, besides the photography, which was really beautiful, um, what was the water temperature like? And what did you use for a wetsuit? The water temperature varies depending on what islands you're at. On the North Islands, Darwin and Wolf, where most of these images are from, it's pretty warm, mid to high 70s. And on the Southern Island, like Fernandina, Isabella, it will get colder down to like, high 60s, you know, I, I think it's still very warm. There was a couple from Honduras that were on the boat and they were freezing on every single dive. They thought it was the coldest diving ever. I said, well, last week or a few months ago, I was diving into ice and stuff. And this is pretty yeah, warm. Just so. laugh at that. <laughs> yeah. I was diving in a seven mil wetsuit. Everyone else was in five mil and stuff. I don't have a thinner wetsuit than that, so that's what I brought. And more so you need the thickness of the wetsuit because you're sitting a lot of times on the reef, which is mainly rocky reefs, not coral reefs, because it's very, very strong current. So you need the wetsuit for protection. Uh, my experience was take a new pair of gloves and throw them away when you're done. Yes. Well, thank you, Jake. That was, uh, they said, that was terrific. So, thank, thank you, you very much. Now, um, Daryl, uh, as I mentioned, is going to talk about uh, depth of field. And if, if any of you, before you begin, Daryl, if anyone has any um, technical or something a, a, a issue with photography itself not with subjects so um like whether it's in this case depth of field please let whitney know and then we will uh, have a presentation on on that or try to have one because uh, we have done many of these in the past but like i said that was a, probably a few years ago so that we have a lot of new people and that there's certain things in photography you find a little confusing. Um, and if we can, we would be glad to, uh, to help. So Daryl, I will turn over the depth of field to you. Okay. So let me get started real quick. Okay, so about hmm, just over a year, ago, I did a presentation on photography fundamentals. Um, 
there's, you know, and I ended up with in that presentation saying, you know, depth of field would be a great presentation to be able to do. And um, Andy reached out to me and said, hey, let's just, uh, let's do it. So let me start off with just a couple of things. So um, I consider myself an experienced learner. I am not an expert. Um, there were probably people experts in attendance tonight. Who knows? Um, I have reduced some of the content down to, uh, for the sake of time, uh, also to reduce any confusing terms uh, because, you know, photographers are a demented bunch when it comes to f-stops and stuff like that. Um, feel free to ask questions after the presentation. I will also provide any of the references that I used uh, for material because uh, I did find some great uh, graphical uh, material for this. So I'd like to first start off with just a simple statement. Depth of field is basically just that area in front behind a subject that remains in focus. Uh, we'll work from simple and work our way up to some fun, some technical stuff, some technology stuff also. So um, see if my actual little GIFs actually run. Okay, there, it's just a little slow. Um, so this little GIF, um, little animated thing that it shows basically what depth of field looks like where you would have something out of focus, either behind or in front of your subject. Um, that area, a lot of photographers just call their sweet spot. They have know exactly where to place their camera when they're dealing with the subject, especially with macro photography to hit the sweet spot. And then they will get their focus directly on what they want of that subject. Now, Shallow depth of field um, is used a lot. So depth of field is not something to aspire to get the most depth of field. It's also a, te a technique uh, to add interest to a photograph. So shallow depth of field uh, can be used to blur the background and essent essentiate a subject. Um, now you can adjust it a couple of different ways and I'll go over this. Um, Basically, and there are some limitations. So with depth of field, there's gonna be limitations on just how far you can push it, how much depth of field you can get. Plus there's gonna be environmental conditions, equipment and stuff like that might adjust it. But the key point I wanna to bring to this is optimizing the photograph is really all about utilizing learned skills. And I'm gonna do my best uh, to go through these and at least give one good example. Now, I would be remiss, oops, remiss if I didn't say that you could adjust depth of field by just moving your camera backwards and forwards, because literally, if you move away from the subject, you'll actually have more uh, depth of field. Um, it is definitely uh, the case for wide angle photography. So I did want to cover the basics. Now, the usual way of adjusting depth of field is to use f-stops. Um, now, an f-stop is adjusting both depth of field and exposure. So you, you need to be balanced and used to have some moderation. Um, and I'll go through that. Um, now, because f-stop is normally expressed as a ratio, which is in um, my little animated GIF here as a, a, um, a fractional, element. Um, I don't want her to get into it because people hate fractions. Um, so what I want to do is let's, let's talk about f-stops where the camera actually shows them. So um, anything with a larger aperture, which is what f-stop controls, um, will be a larger aperture will be a smaller, a smaller f-stop. Um, sorry, smaller number. Okay, so a smaller f-stop uh, such as the 2.8 or the f5.6 uh, is going to give you a shallow depth of field. Smaller, the smaller the f-stop, the shallow your depth of field would be. Uh, the larger your f-stop, the more depth of field you're going to be able to get from it. But you're also adjusting exposure, so you might need to add some more um, strobe power to that. And I will cover that a little bit more. Uh, it is simple as that when it comes to the f-stop. Uh, there's no real reason to get much more detailed because I'm going to be adding some layers to this. Um, the other thing I want to go through is 
one of the cool terms that comes from depth of field, uh, which is actually expressed in the top, um, top right hand uh, graphic I have here is that when your background goes out of focus, uh, there's a fun photography term, which is, I like to just call it bokeh. It actually comes from a, uh, a Japanese term, um, meaning, you know, uh, blurry or blurry, blurry quality. Um, I also feel I'm saying bokeh wrong, uh, just the way that it's spelled, which is uh, B-O-K-E-H. Um, but I've heard several people say it, and I've just stuck with that. Uh, people might have different ways of saying it. Uh, now, the, uh, the lower graphic, which you saw before, is basically what would happen in macro photography, uh, with you could have a, so, uh, something in front, of the, in front of the subject and something behind the, the subject getting out of the water, and you're extending the depth of field in the middle. So let's look at this a little more closely. Um, once again, I put the f-stops in red here instead of using the fractional uh, equivalents, because uh, once again, I don't want to confuse people with fractions. Um, first of all, these aren't uh, gray fish tanks. Uh, when I first look at this, I'm like, oh, these look, it's a popular tank of fish with fish tanks. No, this, the gray boxes are showing the adjusted depth of field. So we have three different, we have the same scene in three different scenarios just adjusting the f-stop on the camera, everything else uh, staying in play. So and I'll quickly go through these. Um, so basically, the top one is basically you want to take a photograph of just the shark, uh, leaving the, um, the unaware fish and the uh, coral faded out. Uh, that's a fairly normal thing, uh, typically, this is be wide angle photography. Would you be doing this? And that's a little harder to do, uh, but it is it is possible. Um, typically, you know, most things with depth of field are going to really be occurring when you're getting into smaller subjects. Now, let's say the the second option we have here, which is you want to get both the shark and the possibly unaware uh, fish. Uh, so basically, if we um, increase our f-stop, uh, therefore increasing the depth of field, leaving the coral um, blurred out in the background. Um, this is a very common thing for people to do. And then if we want to try to get everything in the subject, which is where most photographers, when they're starting off, try to do, they try to get everything in focus, which I'm gonna to try to make the point that that's not always what you wanna do. Um, you go to a much higher um, f-stop. So in this case, f-22. Um, now, I do want to mention, and once again, I'm trying to keep things simple. Um, when you're adjusting the f-stop, you're adjusting the aperture, the actual opening into the lens, uh, which is actually shown in these pictures as a, the, the um, aperture getting smaller as you go higher in f-stop. Um, I had covered that when I was doing photography fundamentals. I didn't want to go over it a whole lot more than we actually needed. Uh, now, as I said before, the as you actually increase your depth of field, you're actually adjusting exposure also, um, which means, and you're also uh, taking in more of the subject with a higher, higher f-stop and a larger depth of field. So you're gonna need to want, need more stroke power. Now, a lot of cameras are using TTL, stuff like that, so it'll, it should compensate itself, but a lot of people still run their strobes in manual mode and they'll have to remember to compensate uh, for extra lighting power. Um, the same could be said when you're lowering your f-stop and going to a smaller um, depth of field, you'll want to lower your strobe a little bit so you don't blast uh, the poor little creature. Now, I want to add a little bit of science to this. So there becomes a point of diminishing returns. With, if you increase the f-stop too much and that aperture gets too small, you'll actually um, will start bringing in some high school physics, you actually get into diffraction. Now, diffraction is when light, which normally is working as a particle, now is working as a wave. Um, and it actually bends. Now, don't stare at this graphic too often because you'll, you'll get mesmerized. Uh, the light actually bends as it goes through the smaller orifice, the smaller hole. Uh, this actually causes the entire photograph to actually get out of focus slightly. 
Now, it's not enough to you'd really notice unless you're in post processing, you um, you blow the photo up to 100%, you'll actually notice that what you expected to be tack sharp is actually a little bit of focus because you went a little bit too high using an f-stop. Now, one interesting thing, and this is, I'll get into this a little bit later about the difference on sensor sizes and how they affect uh, depth of field, is digital SLRs can go a much higher f-stop before diffraction becomes an issue because of a bigger lens. Uh, point and shoot, compact cameras, they actually will run into diffraction much sooner, sometimes around a little past F8. Now, in both cases where diffraction really comes into play is when you're shooting near a one-to-one -one or a super macro, uh, where your depth of field is very thin. Um, and you have to be very careful in where you choose your focal point, the point of the subject that you actually want to be as tack sharp as possible. Uh, most of us use it the eye of the animal because we're human and our humans look for the eye first and then move on from there. Um, so with that, you know, you're normally starting around F16. Um, this is actually something that Andy taught me when, when, as soon, um, when I moved from a point and shoot to a mirrorless uh, digital SLR type camera. I was not pushing my f-stop far enough are high enough to actually get the depth of field that I wanted, uh, especially when you're diving New England and you got surge and you only have that, you know, your, your, your subject, you're moving, your subject's moving a little bit and you wanna get the shot. So depth of, larger depth of field helps. Now, a lot of people, I did a little research and a lot of people do run super macro going as far as F35 or even higher. Uh, of course, this all depends on your camera, all depends on your, your setup. Uh, but I thought this was some interesting high school physics that I could bring into this, uh, being an engineer. Um, okay, so I want to get into a quick scenario, and I want to do like the most common scenario, uh, which is a small fish sitting up against, sitting up against or on rock of coral. Um, the typical issue here is that the fish is too long to get all in focus due to the your current depth of field. Um, now, as an underwater photographer, there's a couple of questions going to go for your head, which is like, well, how much depth of field do I really need for this? Do I want the, do I want to blur the background, or do I want to focus? Do I want to shoot super macro or, or a one to one? And and if that's the case, you know, am I okay with the possibility of some diffraction in this? Um, so. Let's go for two possibilities. So for option one, which is where most photographers would, you know, starting off would try to do, they would, they would actually increase their f-stop, get a larger depth of field. Um, they would focus on the eye of the animal. Once again, humans, we go to the, we look at the eye of the animal first. Um, and then you'd slightly uh, take a picture from a slight angle to try to get more of the, the uh, fish into that small that depth of field. Uh, and of course, increasing your stroke power if it's manually controlled. Um, what we would get is, in this case here, um, we get a cool fish. But um, if you keep, if you notice a couple of things, um, whoops, this all happens when I, uh, the tail is a little out of focus. Um, we didn't get the whole, the whole animal. It's very hard to get the whole animal into uh, your depth of field. Um, the other thing about this, talking composition-wise, I mean, the, the color of the animal is actually a little off, uh, very close to the background. So it does seem to blend in still um, doing this. So let's look at a, another option. Which is to decrease your f-stop, narrow your depth of field, uh, to make the rock of the coral out of focus, and then we take a head-on sh shot of the, the same fish. Both we keep both eyes in focus, maybe reduce our strobe a little bit, and we get this shot. And for most people, this would be the superior shot of the fish. The other shot of the fish is perfectly fine for doing fish ID. And that's really what I call those type of shots because everyone does them when they start um, doing photography, they'll take the fish ID shot. Um, but this is a much more presentable shot and a lot of people actually like this a lot more. Um, it shows you get the nice, um, you get the 
the face of the fish, its gels um, in focus. You'll notice that the, the top of the, the fish's snout is a little out of focus because you had a narrow depth of field. Um, but the rest, the rest of the fish is out of focus, but it doesn't matter because the eyes are nice and sharp. Um, hopefully everyone agrees this, is, this is, would be a nice photo. So I do want to get into this fun debate because we did uh, last month, someone did bring up the micro um, smaller sensor cameras. And it seems like a lot of people keep asking what is better, is a smaller camera better? Uh, for depth of field. Um, not to add a whole lot of con uh, complexity to this, but you know the depth of field and the f-stops are really based upon a ratio, and that ratio depends on the lens you're using. So you could literally have a point-and-shoot camera and a certain lens on a full-frame camera, and you could get the same depth of field. The thing you can't get away from between a small sensor and a large sensor is magnification. Magnification is, a, is one of the key factors that will always have a larger sensor camera having a, a shallower depth of field. Um, and I'll see if I can illustrate it here with a, a cool little aperture lens diagram. Um, the top one, of course, is a larger sensor camera. Uh, the bottom one is a smaller sensor camera um, with equally sized uh, lenses and apertures. So let's start with the smaller sensor camera. So basically depth of field is based upon just how, how quickly your focus falls off. Um, because it's a much shallower angle that you're, you're, because of the magnification, your focus falls off much um, slower for a uh, smaller sensor camera, therefore you get a larger depth of field. With the exact same height of a rectangle here to try to illustrate this, you'll notice that the larger sensor camera will have a shorter depth of field. And there's really no easy way around this other than some fun with the lenses and stuff like that. Now, what's interesting um, about this is that it's, really no camera is better than another. It really, they're both kinds of cameras have their benefits. A small camera, a sensor camera benefits from having a wider depth of field. A larger sensor camera benefits from being able to um, have a smaller depth of field and be able to uh, easily take the background out of focus, therefore highlighting a subject. Uh, it's easier to do it with, with a larger sensor camera, a digital SLR, a mirrorless camera than it is a smaller sensor camera. So both are great depending on your need. Um, I wanted to leave a lot of time for uh, discussion with this, plus I normally go way over time. Now, I do want to bring up a, a cool little technology thing. Um, so some people have asked exactly, well, what camera out there can do it all? What's camera, can you have all the benefits of a large sensor camera and all the depth of field capability of a small sensor camera? Well, cameras like that do exist. Um, we don't use them for underwater photography, though. They're called light field cameras. And I wanted this added thing because of a, I'm a technology geek and I, I wanted to bring this up. You might see these showing up in underwater photography in a couple of years. Um, the camera I'm showing here, um, you know, the cool thing about light field cameras is they're not already taking uh, the intensity of camera like traditional cameras, but they're, uh, they're keeping record of the directionality of the light rays coming into the camera. Now, they typically all do this with having multiple lenses, which is kind of like you, in your mind, combining a small sensor camera with a large sensor camera, because literally that's what they're doing. Uh, here's a camera. I think it has nine plus lenses on it. This very likely could, could be what you'll see in digital photography in a couple of years. Now, we already have this. The newest iPhone that uses the same technology. It's a reason why a, the small sensors on a iPhone or Android phone or something's modern that has multiple camera lenses is able to do both um, very good depth of field and very good bokeh at the same time. 
because it's taking the input of all those lenses that are all set up with different focal lengths and combining it with software, probably with artificial intelligence, uh, to give you the best of all worlds. Um, I thought this was interesting only because they have that question that just keeps coming up, you know, are small sensor cameras better? They are for certain things. Um, I went quick. So why do we open this up to questions? Um, my hope is that people can share some stories also. Everyone's very silent. Daryl, <laughs> yep. could you go back to the uh, slide that showed the large lens and the, the large uh, sensor and the small sensor? Sure. So <clears throat> the large uh, sensor is on the top. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Small on the bottom. And the uh, yellow squares uh, represent what? Is that the depth of That field? is illustrating the depth of field. Maybe I didn't, uh, I didn't say that precisely. Well, that's okay. I'm trying to, you, you were precise. It's my own imprecisivity, if that's a word that has to do here. So yeah. when, when we look at the, the um, camera sensor going out to the subject, right? Yes. The, the, the small aperture has a longer depth of field? Is has a true? longer depth of field, yes. Okay. And so what difference does that make at the point of the subject? Well, to, to make this illustration work, um, what I did is I basically took the center of the subject because you're, you're typically, you know, you're gonna be focusing directly on the subject. And I extended the depth of field in just one direction. Um, because I figured if I did it in both directions, it would be more confusing for people. I probably should have covered that. That's okay. I, so, so each of these cameras is using the same f-stop. With everything, with everything the same. Now, remember that f-stop is a, is of course is a ratio a bit depending on the lens. So you could have two cameras with the exact same f-stop, but working totally different. Right. As far as depth of field. Gotcha. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, good presentation and a, a lot to kind of chew on here. Yeah. What I tried to do here is I tried to keep a lot of the math out of, out of, out of this, uh, but I did need to put it in at the, towards the end to, to actually properly explain this. Uh, yeah, you know, because F-stop is, is really based upon the lens per se. And, you know, Maybe we could ever do a presentation just on lenses in general, because you know, as you know, lenses have a focal length. Like uh, myself and right. and Andy, we we use a macro lens that's like ninety to one hundred millimeters as its focal length. Uh, but within the focal length, there's going to be a set, you know, sweet f stop for that um, for that lens. It's usually like, I guess the cheaper ones would be like you know five point six or something like that. Um, faster lenses, um, once again, using another terminology, um, would be smaller f-stops. Any other qu any quick questions? Because I, I went for this much quicker than I was expecting, but I normally go very, uh, go very long when I do these. Oh, I think, I, I don't know if it's a question as much, but I think I, I really like this because it made it clearer because I'm, I used to use the hyperfocal distance when I use a, a, a wide angle lens, to yeah. kind of uh, pre-focus it. So then I can just quickly take shots without having to mess around and just knowing that everything from my, from one point all the way to infinity would be in focus. So this kind of helps me um, kind of in my mind have a visual representation of that. Yeah. I think yeah. it's cool. I think a focal lens, uh, a length uh, presentation would be very helpful in terms of lenses. Yeah, it would, it would be great, uh, especially those of us who there have uh, point shoots uh, that can use um, different lenses, or those people using wet mount lenses. You know exactly what does that do? Yeah. Your photographs. It's a very confusing issue. 
The only thing, the only harm that can be done is leave us more confused or leave me more confused. <laughs> yeah, well, I tried very hard to make this a, a non-confusing uh, type presentation. Uh, I, I tried to just pick certain subjects that would, would mean the most to the group. Now, of course, this is a wide array of different experiences with this group. So I did sort of leave it very basic and then try to add on top of that to handle all levels of experience. It, it is a hard thing to do. Yes, it's a very hard thing, Daryl. You did you did a great job, and, and it is because just as you said, there's such a, a wide variety of experiences and 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 equipment. So they're all all uh, all have their own own issues. And you know, to date myself, but does anyone else miss the um, the old manual lens days when you could actually see the depth of field markings on the lens itself, yeah. <laughs> and you never even had to look through the camera to to focus it? Very true. Very true. Yeah. I, used, I used to have a uh, lens port that actually let me see the lens. All my recent cameras don't are all black plastic, so you can't even see the lens and its markings. Because a lot of my original ones, you would actually see those things adjusting on the lens. You could actually look over and says, oh, look, it went to this. There's um, uh, just as an addition, I did come across, there's a very good app in terms of depth of field um, where you can, it takes the model, the make of the brand of the camera, the lens that you're using. Um, and then it, it does the circle of confusion and the depth of field calculations and everything else. So you can, you can predict a lot of it before. I'll, I'll see if I can throw that somewhere, but that's, um, it's, it's a pretty cool app actually that helps. That's a, that sounds cool. Oh, throw in the yeah. chat if you can find it. I'm gonna throw the uh, URLs for some of the sources that I found um, into the chat. Um, I do wanna call out one cool thing here. So this, this chart here, which I thought was, was great when I found this, this actually came from an online page called the Complete Guide to the Quarantined Underwater Photographer. <laughs> which I thought was great. <laughs> great title, great title. Okay, I'm gonna shut this down so everybody can have their... Okay. You know, you uh, mentioned, Daryl, you know, about you know, each of the types of cameras, small sensor, large sensor has, you know, produces, uh, they both produce very good results, but yet uh, different results. There's uh, a, a photographer in the UK, a guy named Jim Anderson, who primarily shoots neuterbranks and uh, you know field guides and all kinds of stuff that he, he's done. And he, you, it's clear as anything when you see the, because when you see the, the photographs of the neuterbranks, some of the neuterbranks, when you're looking at the front section where the rhinophores are, they're you know, very sharp. And then it tapers off at the very end of the neuterbrank, even though it's a small neuterbrank, it's all out of focus. So some of the times he's reshot it again with a compact camera, and then you have focus tack sharp from the front to the rear of the neuterbrank. So, it's, so he uses the tool he needs for to, to produce the result he needs. So it well, goes right along with what you were saying. Now we go to things that, that move. Daryl, thank you for I continue on here. I want to thank you very much. That was that was great. Now, Mike, Mike Gary, you're gonna take us to and, and we're gonna see some movement now. Moving pictures. Moving pictures. And that's part of the beauty of the underwater world. Uh, and I know I'm one of the many people who just shoot stills, but you see the movement and that's part of the beauty in the underwater world. So uh, take it away, Mike. All right. So I'm gonna start with my most famous video. This video, literally put me on the map. When I published it in 2020, it very quickly went viral. This was taken in San Salvador in the Bahamas. It is an Atlantic bottlenose dolphin who uh, apparently took quite a shine to me and showed off for uh, almost 40 minutes in front of my camera. Wow. And uh, this particular video 
as I said, went viral. I uh, rough estimate at this point, it has been viewed over a hundred million times. Oh it still to this day after two years gets reposted on Instagram every single day. It has been featured on USA Today, uh, BBC, Discovery. Um, it, it has really caught the interest of, of uh, people who love dolphins in particular. And uh, it, it made a big difference for me as far as my uh, presence on social media. So this one is by far my favorite video of all. My next one is a, a fun little shot. This is, I call this the Blenny battle. This was taken in the Sea of Cortez. It's a couple of uh, male signal Blennies who are fighting over who gets the girl. <laughs> and uh, the reason I chose this one as one of my favorites is because this is a great example of territorial behavior. Hey Mike, when, when you did the share, did you tell it that you're showing video? I don't know. Why is it not coming through? It, it's, it's very jerky. Um, it's, it's like a bunch of stills. So when you did the share, there's a button that says this is gonna include videos and you need to make sure that that is checked. Advanced it is sharing not checked options. by default. Uh, where do I find it, that? Is that in my preferences? To, Stop, stop the share and start it again and look for that button and make sure you've checked it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Is that <clears throat> advanced? Uh, no, it should be right at the bottom when you say share and you're gonna choose which window to share. At the bottom, there should be two check boxes. It's one of which says- the video clip. I'm sorry? Optimize for video clip. Do you see up arrow? On the bottom of the, before you select which screen, it should be right at the bottom. Uh, oh, there you go. I found it. Okay. Not, and Micah, I don't think people would mind. Would you replay the, uh, the dolphin one? Sure. Okay, let's try that again. How's that? Is that better? Oh, yeah. Much. Much, much better. Thanks, Ellen. <laughs> Thank you. So this guy, uh, as I said, I had a good 40 minutes just with me and him. He, he kept going around me, doing all kinds of crazy flips and turns. Um, not only is this my most popular video, but it's also the most controversial. A lot of people seem to think that this dolphin is displaying stress behavior and that he is not happy and, in fact, is acting aggressively towards me. Um, however, based on the 40 minutes of video that I have of this guy, it's, it's hard for me to credit that because there are, I have scenes of the dolphin playing in my bubbles and, and swimming around me in a slow circle, showing me his belly. So, and the dive master that was there, she was completely convinced that the dolphin was having a great time. <clears throat> so, Here's the Battle of the Blennies. And as I said, I, I love this video just because it's, it's such a great example of territorial behavior. The, the colors of the two Blennies, I think, are absolutely beautiful. And uh, no Blennies were harmed in the making of this motion picture. <laughs> At, uh, after, after I was done with this shot, I, I actually moved the two of them away so that they didn't get too aggressive. This was shot in the Sea of Cortez off of uh, Isla de Zanti. 
Now, my next video brings us to the Gardens of the Queen in Cuba. This is uh, surrounded by sharks. And I particularly like this video because of how close I got to such a large group of sharks. These are Caribbean reef sharks. And this is a, a sign of a very healthy reef is a, is a thriving shark population. And as you can see, they, they were all around me. Now we jump over to Curacao. This is a spotted cleaner shrimp about to get body slammed by a pink tipped sea anemone. And I particularly like this one because of the, the, the beautiful colors and just the, the cute interaction of the sea anemone and the, and the shrimp. Now we head over to the Socorro Islands. This is San Benedicto. This is a giant black manta that zooms over me like uh, a scene from The Empire Strikes Back. This is again uh, one of my favorites because of the close proximity I got to this manta. Several times it came up to me very close. How big do you think he was? This guy was probably 14 feet across. Now we head over to St. Lucia. This is a juvenile smooth trunk fish. And I think this is one of the most adorable sea creatures I've ever been able to capture. And I contrast that with an adult seen on the same dive, which is one of the reasons why this particular video made it, the, the incredible cuteness of the subject and the fact that I was able to get both the juvenile and the adult on the same dive makes this one of my favorite videos. And I especially like how the, the, the way they swim is it hasn't changed, even though the, the adult and the, and the juvenile are such drastically different sizes. The juvenile is probably the size of a dime, whereas the adult was um, probably well over a foot. Mike, we have a question in the chat, um, just asking, what are you shooting the videos with? I shoot all my videos with the Paralens dive camera. Thank you. So now we go from the tropical waters of St. Lucia up to the rather chilly waters of Hornby Island, British Columbia. This is a stellar sea lion who has become fascinated with my dive computer and would like to take a bite out of it, apparently. So I'm holding my camera off to one side. And at one point, I actually use my camera to fend him off. And I particularly like this video because of the, the, the interaction between me and the sea lion. And here you can see I'm using the camera now to kind of shoo him away. Hmm. 
You don't have all the sea lions trying to jump up on the boat, do you? No. This was uh, one of my favorite dive trips because it was the most incredible interaction with marine life of any trip I've ever been on. Those stellar sea lions were extremely curious and played with us on every dive. So now we jump over to Cozumel and we see here a cowfish mating dance. These two guys spiral up in the water column in their little mating ritual. And I, I like this one in particular because they are just so darn cute. And watching them swim and smooching and spiraling around, I, I, I just really enjoy this video quite a bit. Now we're gonna head over to the Maldives. This is a hawksbill sea turtle having a little snack. And the reason why this is one of my favorites is because I was able to just hunker right down next to this critter and he was completely unfazed by my presence. This was a this was a pretty big turtle, easily three feet from nose to tail. And of course, everybody loves turtles, so you can't go wrong with that. Now, here we have a juvenile spotted drum taken in off the Turniff Island Atoll in Belize. And one of the reasons I like this video in particular is the contrast between the black and white of the subject and the colorful background. It really makes the, the fish stand out. Let me play it. Oh, we didn't hear. Good time. And again in Belize, this is a green moray eel who, for whatever reason, decided he wanted to come right in and check out my camera. And this guy in particular was uh, very curious throughout the dive. More than once, he swam right up to me. And at one point, he actually rested his, his nose right on my camera tray and just sat there staring at me. It was, uh, it was actually kind of neat. Now we head over to Little Cayman and here we see a Nassau grouper getting cleaned by some cleaner shrimp and some gobies. And I like this particular video because it's a, it's a great example of the symbiotic relationship between uh, 
the different species involved here. And then we jump over to Mexico on the Pacific coast. This is a tiger snake eel who was crawling along the sea bottom, but apparently wasn't too keen on the paparazzi and decided to uh, disappear. So those are uh, my, some of my favorite videos. Oh, terrific. <laughs> Whoa. That dolphin was really amazing. Yeah, as I said, it's, uh, it's gone viral. It, it is still, not a day goes by when it doesn't get reposted on Instagram or shared on Facebook. This, uh, this particular one is what kind of put me on the map, so to speak, and really set off my presence in social media. I, uh, I now have um, well over 8,000 followers. But negative two. I have to. I agree with you. It, it doesn't look like a threatening behavior, or like he's, like he's. It, it looks like he's playing, or it's playing. He or she well, I have. Uh, I have, as I said, forty minutes of video with this guy, and um, I, I have uh, different clips where I have the the uh, the dolphin playing in my bubbles, showing me his belly, interacting with some of the other divers. And it, it, it's hard to credit that it's aggressive or stressed when we were out in the middle of, of nowhere. As if you noticed in the background, it was just a flat sandy bottom for as far as you could see. And the visibility was at least a hundred feet. And it's, so it's not like the dolphin was cornered or couldn't get away from us if it wanted to. Um, so Whitney, you need to schedule another trip to Riding Rock so we can uh, see if we can track him down again. I'm thinking about it, so. Yeah. For sure. So that was Riding Rock Inn? In the that was the Riding Rock Resort in San Salvador. January. Lovely place. It was back in uh, January of 2020. Wow. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank, Thank you. you. And thank you all. Thanks, uh, Jake and Daryl. Um, great presentations tonight. That was terrific. Uh, and we do have a, a, one opening for next month. Uh, so if there's anyone, we do have a, a favorites uh, already selected. So if there's, I'll be sending out, uh, Whitney will be sending out some uh, <coughs> emails to try and see if anybody is is interested. Um, so uh, with that, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. And uh, hope we all get in the water soon and, and shoot something. So we'll share it on uh, one of our future meetings. OK. Good night, all. Thank Good night. you. Thank 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 you.